Dmitry Babich, who's currently in Moscow, and he is actually a journalist, a 30 years journalist. He often appears on RT, the BBC, um, which probably after you've spoken on this vigil won't be happening again. Um, yeah. And I've forgotten who else you said you talked. Oh, right. And, and Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera. And yeah, and Press TV, the, the Iranian station, Press TV, they also show me sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what is important is that uh, I have been working in the mm -hmm. Russian and foreign media for all of these years, for all of these decades. And I can assure you that the case of Julian Assange is unique. <clears throat> and the reason why it is watched so closely in Russia is because we understand he is suffering. We understand the collision around him. And sorry, uh, I, sorry, what did the, you the say? Conflict, collusion? Conflict, you know, the, the, the conflict that led to this drama in London. I think we understand it better than anyone because uh, I think this is very important. This is very important that we look upon what's going on in London right now from the point of view of general struggle for human freedom, for human dignity, uh, it is very important not to allow the American government, the British government, uh, the other Western governments, including the Swedes, it's very important not to allow them pose as the protectors of freedom, as the fighters against the communism, uh, the people who saved of humankind from Nazism, the people who protect freedom, they are not protectors of freedom. And the case of Julian Assange, if you ask me for a parallel that we in Russia have, this is the case of the Hungarian Cardinal Mincenti, who has been locked up in the American embassy for 14 years after the Hungarian revolution in 1956, he could not leave that embassy. <clears throat> Why? Because the, the communist authorities in Hungary would immediately arrest him if he left the embassy. So it was absolutely the same story as with Julian Assange. But this time, the American government is not protecting someone. It is actually out to get someone who told the truth. See? Uh, this is something that I want, <clears throat> that I absolutely want people to understand. Evil, you know, the, the limitations on freedom, forces limiting freedom, they are not uh, uh, confined to one country forever. You know, the, the uh, impression that the Western media, that the mainstream media is trying to create is that Russia has always been bad and it has always been unfree. China has always been bad. Uh, and it always, uh, you know, limited the freedoms of the people. And the United States or Western Europe, we have always been good. And we are good now. And we are protecting freedom now. No, this is the problem. Evil migrates from one country to another. Evil uh, uh, is, uh, uh, it's actually created by wrong ideologies. It's not created by specific ethnic or uh, 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 national features of a certain people. Right now, to my mind, the ideology which is, uh, which is uh, ruling the West, this ideology is very radical, I would say extremist. It does not exclude wars as, as uh, the tools for uh, speeding up uh, humankind's development. It does not include lies. You know, lies are supposed to be, supposed to be permitted in the United States now and in the European Union, if they serve their political purpose, if they serve their ideological purpose. That makes the modern Western ultra-liberal ideology very close to Bolshevism, you know, the terrible extremist ideology that has been, that has been oppressing this country where I am now for 70 years. So we understand the plight of Julian Assange probably better than a lot of people in the West, because we see the parallels. Look, uh, what did Julian Assange do? What made, what actually made 
the, the authorities in the United States and in the European Union so angry. Of course, it was not revealing the names of agents. Uh, actually, uh, Julian did not reveal any aims, uh, names. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's obvious that uh, he did not act against the state interests of the United States. He revealed the cruel nature of the war in Iraq. He revealed uh, the huge amount of lies uh, that the Western governments and the Western media produced while pursuing a very hostile policy towards Russia, towards China, towards uh, uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, basically uh, uh, protective national liberation movements in the Middle East. Uh, and Julian Assange was not afraid to reveal it all. This is what made, this is what made the governments in the West so angry. He revealed, if you actually generalize, if you take in a nutshell what he said, he revealed in a nutshell all the totalitarian uh, elements of, uh, of the policies of the United States and the European Union. And uh, that could not be forgiven. Uh, just to give you very briefly my view why the modern ideology of the West is extremist. I think that a lot of people, a lot of our listeners, uh, they just look at the consequences of this ideology. They see the war in Iraq, they see the war in Libya, they see the war in Syria, they see uh, the Western interventions in Yugoslavia and in Ukraine, and, and they, they, they are terrified, but they don't understand what happened. Why are Western governments basically starting wars? And I can tell you what happened. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, we had three, basically three, secular ideologies uh, gaining a lot of uh, moral power in, in, in Europe primarily and in the United States. It was nationalism, socialism, and, and liberalism. And all these three ideologies in small amounts are okay. They actually uh, did a certain service to mankind. But all three of them had terrible radical variants. They had, if you want, ideological bastards that, that, that created a lot of mischief and that killed a lot of people. The bastard of nationalism was Nazi Germany. I think there is absolutely no doubt about that. The bastard of socialist ideas, the bastard of socialism of the 19th century was the early Soviet Union, early Soviet Union and Maoist China and North Korea. And now, we live to the day when basically the Western world is ruled by the bastard of liberalism. It's a very radical, cruel, uh, deceitful ideology, which just like Bolshevism, just like Nazism, says that ends justify the means. And we are seeing it every day, you know. Just recently, the American people could see how this ideology worked uh, against uh, uh, President Trump, how it worked in favor of Hillary Clinton. We saw how it was possible for two years to peddle incredible lies, you know, about Russian, uh, about Trump being a Russian agent, about uh, him colluding with uh, some uh, nasty people, nasty oligarchs from Russia. And it was based on zero evidence. But this is the point about totalitarian ideologies. They don't care about facts. Uh, they think that uh, they're out there to make people happy for thousands of years. So if we lie today, no one will blame us for that in the future. And what is worse, if we kill today, <clears throat> no one will blame us in a few years because humanity will be happy for the next, I don't, I don't know, three or 4,000 years. We survived this kind of thinking in Russia. We know how it works. And people in the West don't know that. They have not been through that, probably with the exception of Germany. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and people in the West, uh, they think that these are separate elements. No, these elements are parts of the whole. 
when the uh, the when the mainstream media uh, created all of these unthinkable lies about Russian collusion for two years, it was just one of the manifestations. Let me give you. Sorry, it, it was it was just one. It was just one of the manifestations of the deceitful oh, oh. nature of this ideology. Let me give you other manifestations. Sorry, Dmitri, the, I just must I just must ask you something. When you yes. say ideology, right, right, every time you say ideology, I feel a bit frantic because mm -hmm. I really, really don't believe that the spirit of the American people is in any way represented by our government. I think most Absolutely. Americans yeah, I think that when you say an ideology, I think I would like to just offer up a simple explanation. We're looking at criminal cartels. Now, you tell me whether you think that Bolshevik Russia was really, you know, essentially a criminal enterprise uh, where people were imprisoned and brutalized in the same way as they are now being here in America. So I would rather say than ideology. Um, I would say that really, this has been an incredible, um, well-designed, organized attempt by criminals to do whatever the hell they want, because there is a complete dislocation between what American people are like, because I live here, you know, I've lived mm. here for 25 years, and what the government does, what the military does. And I have a feeling it's the same in Russia, that the Russian people are these amazing people that love their children and want peace, but they had a government where they were chucking people in gulags and, you know, Absolutely. basically, you know. So, so I think we should, I would like to offer that it's not so much an ideology, it is the result of criminals getting a hold of power. Uh, what well, do you think? Let me explain myself. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, it, it would be very simple, you know, life would be very simple if uh, the nasty people who organize wars and mm -hmm. who, who propagate lies, if they were all just absolute villains, like uh, greedy and, uh, and cruel and killing. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Some of the worst murderers in the history of mankind, sometimes in their personal lives, were decent mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Hitler was a vegetarian. Uh, in, in <laughs> I don't think I don't think you can make a case for Hitler, but okay. No, I'm just I'm not making a case. I'm just explaining you how how it can work. You know. No, no. Listen, yeah. nobody knows better about Hitler. I know he had tea parties and he was very charming to women and he loved dogs and he believed in homeopathy. But you know, this is a this is. I know where you're going with this. You're explaining to me that the people that I think are criminals, they themselves actually are convinced that they are acting on some ideology. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, uh, why I'm using the word ideology is just for your convenience. Uh, because oh. what, I, I, let me explain you what ideology is for me, you know, in very Okay, good. Terms. No, let's, let's get, straighten out terms yeah. here. Well, uh, uh, society, just like humans, they uh, they have plans for the future, okay? Uh, in in countries, sometimes in in uh, alliances of countries such as the European Union, there is a certain plan for the future that we have, okay? And, and you can call it ideology, you know, uh, just like uh, a, a young man, you know, when he decides, okay, I'm going to graduate from school and then I'm going to enroll in university and then I'm going to have a family. This is his plan for the future. Uh, or her plan for the future. And, and ideology is the same for society. Like uh, ultra-liberalism today is, is basically peddling uh, a very primitive, uh, a very simplified version of liberalism. Liberalism was about freedom of movement, you know, allowing people to move from one country to another. It was about freedom of enterprise, you know, allowing people to have their businesses. But then if you drive freedom of movement to an extreme, instead of uh, freedom, you have slavery, when actually huge masses of people are taken from some countries almost violently because conditions in those countries are unbearable. So they're taken from some countries and they're brought to other countries 
uh, as as cheap laborers. Are we talking and about Mexicans in America? Mexicans, or or I'm sorry, or Central Asians in Russia now. I'm I'm oh. not uh, I'm not being apologetic about everything our government is doing. So right. on the surface, on the surface, these people are free. You know, they just moved from from one country to another. Okay, but in reality, they're slaves. Uh, in the same way, in the same way, uh, when uh, we look at the wars that were basically forced on Middle Eastern people, on Iraq or on uh, Syria by the United Sorry. States and Union. Sorry, I missed that. I missed that. You said wars. What, what did wars, you say? Wars. Oh, wars. Wars, wars. wars. When you think about oh, wars, yeah. thrust on the people of the Middle Eastern countries by the United States and the European Union, uh, you may see that theoretically this is all about elections, you know. Uh, the the uh, ideological explanation from Washington or from Brussels is that we just want these people to have free elections. And that's why we're sending them arms. And that's why we're sending them instructors who tell them about the best ways to kill as many people as possible. We're doing it for freedom. We're doing it for elections. Yeah, well, and we know is, that's bullshit, right? Yeah, and, and this is just awful because uh, let me give a, 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 a comparison which is understandable to Europeans. You know, mm -hmm. the terrible wars between Catholics and Protestants in the 16th century. Uh, now we understand that they were barbaric, you know, that it was barbaric to kill thousands of people because they had a different mass, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a religious service, or they, they preferred to read Bible in Latin and not in uh, German. But, mm -hmm. okay. People were arguing about uh, about paradise. You know, the the shortest mm -hmm. way to get to paradise. Okay. Uh, theoretically, uh, the killing in in Iraq, the killing in Syria, if we believe the American government, was about these people having a chance to come to the voting booth. You know, take a bulletin and throw it into the into the box. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that absurd? It's even more absurd than uh, the idea of uh, killing thousands of people in order to find the shortest way to paradise. Uh, something that not even 50% of the population participates in, in Western countries, you know, and, and you are killing uh, hundreds of thousands of people for that? You know, theoretically, <laughs> ideologically, this is uh, the, the, the you know, the official reason for the occupation, it was the official reason for the occupation of Iraq, we're bringing their democracy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I use this word, because uh, unfortunately, the, the biggest killers in the history of mankind, they were not greedy, they were not feeling their pockets, you know. They were supposedly trying to make billions of people happy. And, uh, and uh, it so happened, that uh, uh, these, uh, you know, general plans for humankind that they suggest are called ideologies. Mm -hmm. So I'm just okay. saying this for, for, for the lack of a better one. You know? mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, in Russia, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, are disappointed about the West for a very simple reason, you know. Uh, uh, until something terrible happened in Iraq, or uh, in, in, say, you know, uh, in Grenada, you know, or in Nicaragua, you know, it was far away. <laughs> Very few people in Russia had a good idea what's going on in Iraq, you know, who are the Islamists, who are the, mm. the moderate people, we didn't understand. But we know Ukraine very well. Mm -hmm. It was a part of our country for 400 years, you know, it was a part of Russian Empire even before the United States uh, you know, had it came into existence, <laughs> right? So, so we know very well that country. And when the United States and the European Union support the regime, uh, inside this regime in Ukraine, their chairman of the parliament, Andriy Parubin, the chairman of their parliament, was the founder of the Nationalist Socialist Party of Ukraine in 1991. And we know him very well, you know. We speak his language. We, we saw his speeches. We read his books. We know he is a total uh, villain, you know. 
someone who founded the Nationalist Socialist Party of Ukraine in 1991, he is the chairman of the parliament. And the American and the European politicians meet him, hug him, give him weapons, give him uh, instructors to, to instruct his soldiers to kill as many people as possible, to teach them the best ways of killing people. We are dismayed, and, and this is really close to home. This is something that we understand. And I think this is the most terrible thing about this ultra-liberal ideology, something that Julian exposed, by the way. He exposed this terrible feature of ultra-liberalism. It allies itself to the most uh, crude nationalist groups sometimes. You know, on the surface, Ultra-liberalism, globalism, is about, uh, you know, uh, removing the borders, you know, having international companies and, and free flow of information and, uh, you know, forgetting if you are uh, an Englishman or a Frenchman, a man or a woman, you are, you know, a member of the global community, right? But this ideology, when it fights big countries such as Russia, such as China, simply because these countries are big, and potentially they could be opponents, this ideology allies itself to uh, the most crude nationalist forces, basically to the Nazis. I can give you examples. Mm. Against Russia, but, this but, ideology- Sorry, can, can I just interrupt you? I want to just ask you something in relation to Julian. Um, mm -hmm. do, do, do you think that the Russian government resents Julian as much as the American government resents Julian? Because no. the WikiLeaks and Julian, okay, why would that be? Why? I'm sorry to sort of shift you, but I'm just very curious. Well, and I, will I, explain, been... I will explain to you because this, what I was saying was directly uh, linked to Julian. Julian. No, I just. The, yeah. yeah. Julian <laughs> sorry. was the first one to expose it. To expose it, you know, WikiLeaks right. documents showed the collusion, the real collusion between right. the American government and the Islamists in uh, in Syria. It showed the collusion between mm. uh, the European Union and the Ukrainian Nazis. It showed the collusion uh, between, for example, Western governments and Croatian fascists against Serbia. It showed the collusion mm. of, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it has not yet been revealed, but believe me, it will happen. The United States and the European Union will support Islamists against China. In, in Xinjiang. So uh, this is the trend and the Russian government knows it. And for that reason, the Russian government is not against Julian Assange because he exposed the most dangerous trends in, in the activity of uh, uh, modern Western outer liberalism. I don't want to be apologetic about our government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm against presenting President Putin as <clears throat> some kind of an ideal statesman who is the last Christian in Europe, you know, the last conservative. Right. Uh, he is a normal, if you want, average East European leader who would be average if Russia had been left in peace. But just like in American movies, you remember, you know, I, I like this plot when uh, an ordinary man, you know, a family man is attacked by some evil force and he becomes a hero, you know, he becomes mm -hmm. a hero defending his family, right? The same story happened to Putin. He was supposed to be an average East European leader, you know, uh, in a big Slavic country. But because uh, ultra-liberalism led by the United States and the European Union, because they started this basically aggression against Russia, he became different. He started resisting. He was forced to resist. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, he is sometimes aligning himself to some very decent people, you know, the real heroes. Uh, we all remember Putin was very unwilling to give refuge to Edward Snowden in Russia. But he was. Sorry, he was, he was unwilling. Did he, you was say he was unwilling un to give, uh, to give oh. refuge to Edward Snowden. You remember Snowden mm -hmm. sat in the airport for several sure, weeks. Sure, sure. Yeah, but why he was, why, right, but why, why would he that? be I unwilling? Yeah. Because Putin was not a hero, you know. 
he did not want trouble for Russia. He felt responsible for Russia. He said, you know, he thought, okay, these guys against the United States government, they're out to get him. If I give him asylum, Russia will have problems. I'm responsible primarily to the Russians. You know, I want them to have as little trouble as possible. Okay. But then mm -hmm. Putin was put before an alternative. If you surrender Snowden, then no one will respect you. You, right. uh, it's, like, uh, it's like basically uh, surrendering uh, Jews to the Nazis. Well, right. uh, formerly, Jews were not British citizens. They were not American citizens. Mm -hmm. But when the Western governments just, uh, you know, uh, left them to their left them to their own devices, they lost respect. See, they mm -hmm. lost this high moral position from which they could speak against Hitler. In the same way, if if Putin did not give refuge to uh, uh, Edward Snowden, he would be defeated morally. You know, he would not be respected. So he gave refuge to Edward Snowden, and Russia, I think, is one of the few countries who can give him that refuge. You know, if um, if Snowden went to Ecuador as he wanted, or if he went even to Venezuela, we all understand he would be in American prison now. Well, more than so, likely, though. Those more than likely, that... absolutely. So no, but, uh, but, but, let me sorry. let me again repeat you my position on the Russian government. It's not an ideal government. No. This government wants to be like all the Western governments. They want to have their uh, basically market economy, as they call it, which will be dominated, of course, by big companies. Uh, they want to have banks like in the West. They want to have uh, uh, people working 10 hours a day, uh, you know, in order to uh, fill the pockets of the rich. This is not. A, a very squeaky clean Christian or socialist or whatever government. But uh, the problem is that uh, the ideology and the governments in the European Union and in the United States are so bad, so aggressive, that our government is simply forced to resist them. Uh, again, it, it reminds me of the situation during the Second World War, during the World War II, uh, you know, Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill hated each other. They were very different people, ideologically and morally. But when they faced the common danger, when Nazi Germany uh, appeared to be winning in not only in Europe, but around the world, they united and they started defending their nations and the whole world against Hitler. So in the same way, the Russian government is not ideal. The Chinese government is not ideal. Uh, the governments of Venezuela and Iran and Hezbollah, these are not ideal governments or organizations. But they were forced to fight evil simply by the very rabid, very bold actions of the evil ideology, evil ideology of the West. Again, I agree with you. What the United States is doing in Venezuela, it does not have the mandate of the American people to do it. If American people knew uh, what their government is doing in Venezuela, what had been the life before Chavez and Maduro? The American well, people actually, would... no, they wouldn't support it. And that is really the critical role that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange play is that they not only expose for the general public to, if they take the time to look at it, to understand what's being done in their name, but let's face it, it's kind of bullshit um, because the people that are creating these giant international corporations who are, you know, the whole military industrial complex, these are entities that are crushing human life on this planet that's why i believe that you know you speak about ideology but i just think it's just straight up criminality whether these people have some deluded idea that they've got some kind of ideology they're working to the net result is if they really were actually um working for the american people 
they'd want us to know about it. But because they absolutely do everything in their power to stop us from finding anything out, it really just does seem that we're superfluous. Uh, and uh, sorry, am I speaking too fast? No, so, it's okay. I understand uh, everything. I, okay. I agree with you basically, and I can give you an example. You know, uh, that would make your your thought, I would say, more kind of voluminous. That would give it oh, uh, gosh. a okay. global perspective. Okay. You know, again, we have this experience in Russia. A lot of communists, a lot of communists, uh, or historical now. communists, uh, communists in the Soviet now. Union. Uh, no, no, not now. In the oh. in the old Soviet Union. Okay. A lot of them followed the totalitarian ideology just out of conformism. Just uh, out of what? Sorry, just say that out again? of conformism. Conformism. When you try to conform. Oh, to the conform, gender. conform, That's conformity. Right. right. And it's right. understandable. It's understandable because we are all uh, weak people. We all have families. We all want to live a nice life. So the huge majority of uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know KGB officers and Gulag operators, they did it not because they believe. Uh, in the uh, communist ideology, but because just they wanted to have their own small lives mm -hmm. with their families, without any problems, without having to be, <coughs> having to worry uh, mm -hmm. about being disloyal. And it's the same story in the same, uh, it's the same story with every totalitarian ideology. When Hannah Arendt wrote about the banality of evil, yeah, that's uh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, we see this banality of evil uh, in the United States now. I mean, uh, thousands of journalism, thousands of journalists took part in this uh, in this uh, incredible campaign to prove that uh, Trump was a Russian agent. Are these journalists <laughs> idiots? You know, uh, all of these people, you know, like uh, David Sanger in the New York Times and all of these dozens of reports are they idiots didn't they understand that this is a nothing burger no they mm -hmm. did no they did but they had their jobs they had their children. they had their debts to pay right so in order to have a nice fat job and not worry about uh, being hungry tomorrow they did all of these stupid things you know uh the new york times as we find out now sent several reporters to Prague and, and for several months they were working on a story uh, on something that was non-existent uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, Trump's attorney met, met a Russian agent there in Prague and this was simply non-existent but these reporters, you know, uh, very cunning people, very good at uh, making interviews, talking to people, you know, finding things out they uh, they wasted several months of their lives doing it they got paid for it so their families were okay you know their uh, bank accounts were fine and, and and of course they didn't believe in this nothing burger but they did it simply out of conformity you know being confident this is what i call the banality of evil you know uh, hannah arendt when she spoke about the german officials who just signed some papers and that meant that millions of Jews would be killed in concentration camps. These German officials, uh, you know, as Eichmann uh, said at his trial, uh, ich habe nichts gegen den Juden. I actually have nothing against the Jews. It was his <laughs> job. It was his job. And mm. he wanted to do his job diligently, you know. The same story with these thousands of journalists reporting on Russia. The Sorry, same. can I can I just ask you a question because I'm interested in this aspect of it because I was talking it to the, our previous guests is people's I mean obviously Julian Assange has fully taken responsibility regardless of the consequences to himself his life his family everything so he's the complete opposite of the journalism Absolutely. that you are, are right so what do you think is different for instance in Russia do you think that in Russia people have learnt their lesson about conformity, or do you think that this is really a, a an issue of of mankind that our, our, that man has to evolve or raise their level of 
consciousness so that they will take on these kinds of, uh, you might say, it's sort of like a form of temptation. You know, you want to have your life, you don't want to have any trouble. So it's tempting to just look the other way when other things are going on. Do you think the Russians appreciate Julian Assange because they themselves understand what it meant to look the other way? This is an interesting question, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, we are not better <laughs> than oh. uh, the other nations. So there are people in Russia, nasty people, who want Julian Assange to be in jail. Why? And they write, it? And they write it in the newspapers. Well, no, I, I can give you an example. I can give you an example. Yeah. There is a very well-known journalist mm -hmm. named Konstantin Egert. Uh, and he is prolific. Sorry, you know, who, he writes, who, who does he write for? Who does he write for? He, he writes for Deutsche Welle, uh, the Russian edition. He used to write for Izvestia, which was the most respected newspaper in Russia. He writes for uh, Dost, you know, The Rain. It's a famous television channel, very much uh, supported by the West. He ideologically believes in ultra-liberalism. So for him, Julian Assange is an enemy. Uh, Eggert openly says, Assange acted against the interest of the United States. He acted in the interest of Iran. And, and, what? and this is- what? Yes, exactly. He's, he's acting this, in the interest of this truth. Is a part of, <laughs> this is a part of Eggert's thinking. I think we should understand right. it. Eggert is one of the very few people in Russia. There are very few such people, but they exist. And because we have freedom of media, you can uh, hear their opinion. He thinks that Israel and the United States should attack Iran before Iran gets dreadful weapons. And he propagates this idea in Russia, and he has, he has the ear of some of the people, a small minority, but still there are such people. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, so if you ask me why in Russia, most of the people support Assange and do not fall into this temptation, it's very easy. Again, I will have to say it, because the terrible totalitarian ultra-liberal ideology is not in power here. Unfortunately, it is in power in the United States and in the European Union and in Canada and in Sweden and in Australia. This is the most terrible thing. This is something. Don't that forget, is. don't forget New Zealand. In yes. New Zealand, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, this is tragic because uh, in the 20th century, when we had communist totalitarianism, the communist totalitarian revolutionary countries were in minority: uh, Soviet Union and China. These were important countries, but they were the minority in the UN Security Council in the world at large, right? Now we have the majority ruled by totalitarian ideologies. We have the majority of the members of the UN Security Council under the, the influence of uh, ultra liberals. We have the United States, the UK, France, uh, what else? Uh, 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 they are all representing uh, this ultra liberal ideology. The most prestigious uh, uh, countries in the world, countries with great history, countries with huge soft power, attractive to people. You know, if you ask uh, someone in Africa or in Latin America, uh, what does it, what do you want to live like? You want to live like in Russia or you want to live like in the UK? <clears throat> Most of the people would say, oh, like in the UK, it's, it's a rich country, you know, they have better conditions there. So, uh, in a way, in a way, uh, uh, the current situation is much more dangerous than in the 20th century, because the totalitarians, the radicals, are in the majority, and they have huge technical and military superiority over the moderates. You know very well that the United States has more weapons than all other mm -hmm. countries combined. And if yeah, you and I, add think, I think they, I think they're going to get some more soon as well. Exactly. <laughs> Trump just uh, well, gave yeah, a big. Uh, it's not. Yeah. It's not my statistics. It's from the uh, Stockholm Institute for World Peace. Mm -hmm. NATO's European allies, their military budget, if you take it as a whole, is four times bigger than Russia. It's four times bigger. No one disputes that. But still, 
the European Union says Russia may attack us. We are not prepared to defend their uh, military. Actually, expenses. actually, that that's that's really really significant because how many wars have been fought about these bloody European Eastern borders? What would Russia possibly gain from attacking European countries? What well, I mean, it's what could they possibly gain? And we don't I mean, want to attack them. If, if no, I know, anyone, but I mean that's that's what's so anyone insane. Anyone coming to Russia, anyone coming to Russia, anyone talking to people here during the last fifty years, I live on this uh, earth for almost fifty years. Mm -hmm. I never, never uh, encountered here any desire, any plans. I talk to high officials. I talk to people on the street. Mm -hmm. No one wanted, for example to make Poland again a part of Russia. No, no one wanted to, uh, uh, you know, to have Russian influence spread to La Manche, you know, to the English Channel. Mm -hmm. These ideas, <coughs> mm -hmm. they, they, they simply don't have any support in society. And they have even fewer, even less support in, in the elite. Russian elite is not about territorial gains. The Russian elite is mm -hmm. conformist, <laughs> not very mm -hmm. nice, they want to make their money in mm. Russia and around the world, and they want to be a part of the Western rich class. You know, that's why they send their children to get educated in the UK. That's why they, they uh, introduce Western, terrible Western educational practices in the mm. Russian universities, <clears throat> basically breaking down a lot that has been created uh, during the last uh, 200 years in Russia. So these people were not about territorial gains. Do you know that Russia's largest banks refused to operate in Crimea uh, when Crimea became a part of Russia again? The Sberbank and VTB, the richest Russian banks, they said, we don't support it and we don't operate there because we're afraid of sanctions. And well, Putin look, let, let, me, let me just say something. We only have 10 minutes left. So I really want you to focus on something that mm. I'm very curious about because I hadn't really thought about it before. Are there journalists in Russia who fight for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks to exist? Uh, I mean, I know obviously you're on this program, but are there actual mainstream Russian journalists that are fighting for the concept? You talk about ideologies. I couldn't think of anything more profound than the ideology of truth. And, um, so uh, I'd be so curious. I, I noticed that you don't use your Twitter very much, but if yeah, maybe you, you no, oh, you, you do. Somebody's got you up there as Dmitry Babich. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> perhaps it's probably the KGB. No, they don't exist anymore. Um, yeah. Anyway, but uh, I would love to know who in Russia, who, who would you say is comparable in terms of their... Um, values and their bravery as a journalist in Russian, uh, in, in yeah. who, who would fight for Julian? I mean, I know you're here, but who else? There, there, there are two different things. There are two different things. If we talk about brave people, you know, re really courageous journalists, then mm. I would name Andrei Babitsky, who used to be a darling of the West when he reported about the really terrible things going on in Chechnya, but who immediately fell out of favor with the West when he supported the reunification of Crimea with Russia, and when he absolutely, absolutely protested against the onslaught of the Ukrainian army on the Russian-speaking population in Donbas. Babitsky, who almost several times he got nearly killed in Chechnya during the war there, now he is living in Donbas. He is living in Donetsk. I don't know Princeton. where the, I don't I don't know where that is. Is that in the Crimea? That's no. That's the east of Ukraine, where you have oh. the Russian minority, which is now being attacked oh. by the Ukrainian the terrible Ukrainian. Sorry, I, 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 and I, I, I apologize. I know nothing you know, of geography in Russia. He could yeah. he could leave. He could leave in in the Czech Republic. He had been working mm -hmm. on radio pre Europe for many years. Mm -hmm. He could live in Moscow. But because he is so brave and principled, he went to live in Donbas. He has problems with a job, but 
he he is so <clears throat> honest to himself. He's so mm -hmm. uh, like that that he is like Julian as a person. Mm -hmm. as a person. Well, listen, does he speak English? Well, I, I will I will I will follow. Uh, so this is a person mm -hmm. who is like Julian, but mm -hmm. there are of course many more people who support Assange out of principle and who want to help him. But there is a problem. There is a problem that we need to resolve as journalists. It is clear that uh, the international organizations of journalists that exist now, they are completely subjugated to the ideology of outer liberalism. Assange is not going to be held by the reporters without borders. Forget about the reporters without borders. They don't represent all the journalists. They are servants of the terrible Western modern totalitarian ideology. We need uh, not only Russians, not only Venezuelans, not only Syrians, journalists who oppose the terrible new outer liberal order, we need to create our own organizations, mm -hmm. journalist organizations, citizens organizations, and we need to get our voices heard. This is something that uh, not many, uh, not the majority, but many journalists in Russia understand. And, and there is a movement in this direction. It is very difficult for us to do it because one of the terrible consequences of the 70 years of communist rule is that we almost lost the ability to get organized, you know. Really? Why? Yes. Because people are, people are so sick of being told what to do that they just exactly, want to screw because, it. Exactly, um. because we, <laughs> we have this aversion to collectivism and because right. for many years when you talked about, for example, a journalist organization, it meant that the government gave some money and, uh, and uh, there are some workplaces uh, that you can take and live a nice life, saying some absolutely senseless things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and the Russian government, as I told you, the Russian government actually doesn't want any trouble with the West. They try to limit to the minimum the amount of their conflict zones with the West. Mm -hmm. But these mm -hmm. conflict zones will grow in numbers, not because the Russian government is aggressive, but because the West is aggressive. Look, just recently they they uh, they did not touch the post-Soviet space. They said that okay, we understand. Uh, you know, Mr. Gorbachev he made all these concessions. Uh, we have respect for his bravery. We won't touch the Baltics. We won't touch uh, Ukraine. Now they have a terrible regime in Ukraine which is saying that it will point its missiles at Moscow. And uh, between Kiev and Moscow, we have just two minutes of a missile uh, cruise, right? Right. And, and uh, uh, you, you can understand why Russians are concerned when NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg says that one day we are going to take Ukraine into NATO, because that would mean that American missiles will be placed in, at the distance of two minutes from Moscow. That's why it is unacceptable for us, not because mm -hmm. We want to limit the Ukrainians' freedom to join any alliances they want, right? So now, any sensible um, person knows why Russia, which they tried to do after the Second World War, was put a buffer zone between them and the people that keep bloody absolutely. invading them. But, so yeah, uh, I, yeah. For this, you need some knowledge of history. Not not all the people have it, unfortunately. Uh, right. But uh, uh, I think uh, there is a growing understanding in Russia and in other countries of Eastern Europe that. Uh, we cannot rely on the organizations that were not founded by us. Mm -hmm. Reporters Without Borders serves its masters, its masters mm -hmm. in Washington, its masters in Brussels. They will support someone else. They will support someone who reported on Assange, but they will not support Assange. And, uh, and uh, of course, we need to create our own organizations. We need to uh, be active. And we need to understand, I, I hope that the Russian government will understand that it cannot survive alone. It needs to cooperate with citizens in the West. Not <clears throat> for many years, it was the tactic of uh, Russia and of the Soviet Union, find a decent people at the top in the West, find someone who is not aggressive, and then have a secret diplomatic talk to him and resolve a problem. This is how problems were resolved under Reagan. You know, we had a very effective mm -hmm. ambassador in Washington, Anatoly mm -hmm. Dobrynin, who when a conflict emerged, 
he just called his friends in the White House saying, okay, this is Anatoly. We don't really want to, I don't know, invade Poland. So please, please, you know, let's have this situation resolved. And it was resolved. Now, uh, did you notice what they did? You know, the most terrible consequence of the Russia gate is that now American officials are afraid to have back channels of information exchange with Russia. If yeah, the Cuban and you know, sorry, I've like just Michael got to say. Michael Flynn was got... destroyed for talking yeah. to the Russian ambassador. <laughs> Yeah, no, listen, you've made the most incredibly critical point is that if we make it, I mean, this makes me crazy anyway. What's wrong with talking to the Russians? You know, exactly. it's like, you know, why can't we talk to each other? That you're not committing, you know, treason by having diplomatic conversations or indeed, you know, I mean, even I h hate to refer to the Nazi period, but, you know, even prior to the Second World War, you know, um, I've forgotten his name now. It's some brilliant German name. Uh, he was a foreign minister. He went to England. He visited. He spoke to people. I mean, that is the point of diplomacy. Hello. Is that mm -hmm. is the point of being able to speak well, know, to uh, each let other? Me, let, me, let, let, let me make it very clear. I think you are talking about Rudolf Hess. Uh, Actually, no, I'm not. I'm not. It was the other guy. Um, oh, well, God. He, he, it, he sounds like, it sounds man. like... He was a bad man. But but no, no, I, no. I agree with your point. I agree with your point. Uh, uh, but this is something that we need to understand. All totalitarian ideologies prohibit diplomatic contacts with the enemy, and the enemy for them are normal countries. Uh, in the Soviet Union, Stalin put in prison the wife of his number two person, the wife of Molotov, for what? For talking to the Israeli ambassador and mm. not reporting on that. So when I heard about Michael Flynn being destroyed simply because mm -hmm. he talked to Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, and he didn't inform fully the vice president, it was one for one the story of the imprisonment of uh, Moto's wife, understand? Right. Uh, well, listen, but we've, we've only got a couple more minutes, so I just want to, because we, we go to a break and the, the stream just cuts off, so I don't want that to happen. Um, I just want you to give, from your perspective of having grown up in a country which suffered so terribly from tyranny and especially a utterly destroyed journalistic, you know, uh, environment because there was just Pravda yeah. and something else. What would you say to your Russian journalists about why they should come out and fight for Julian Assange? Because really, I'd like Russian. I mean, you can say it in Russian if you like. Um, please say it in Russian to your fellow journalists who probably don't speak English. Tell them why I they should. It, I would say it not only to Russian journalists, but also to Russian media managers and basically yeah. to the Russian elite as a whole. Don't think that uh, Assange uh, will be in prison and you will stay uh, nice and free and everything will be fine. They will come after you. After they get Assange, we will be the next. После того, как они посадят Джулиана Ассанжа, мы будем следующими. И российские журналисты, и российское правительство, и элита. Вы имеете дело с тоталитарной силой, которая не остановится. So protecting Julian Assange, we are protecting ourselves. He is our first line of defense. In fact, he is not even the first line of defense. The people who died in Ukraine, the people who died in Syria defending the legal government there, they were the first line of defense. Now, Julian Assange is the most uh, well-known, uh, the most publicized victim. And if we let this happen to him, nothing will protect us because Assange is a person whom even the Western media respected, whom even the Western media did not dare demonize him in the beginning. Now think, the Russian government, think what will happen to you after being demonized for so many years. If you don't do anything to protect Assange, who will protect you when they come after you in a few years? That was brilliant, Dimitri. I thank you so much for making such a powerful ending statement for this part of the vigil. And I 
I hope so, so much that in Russia, more and more really principled journalists come forward and really make a noise about protecting truth on this planet, because that's what we're doing. We're protecting truth. And by doing that, we protect humanity. Mm -hmm.